Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ariel Colt. I'm a first year PhD student in the Department of Genetics, Genomics, and Informatics. And I am happy to introduce our guest seminar speaker for today, Dr. Edwards. She is a genetic epidemiologist, associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology and biomedical informatics, director of the Division of Quantitative Sciences in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, director of Women's Health Research Center, investigator of the Vanderbilt Genetics Institute, and a member of the Vanderbilt Epidemiology Center. She has doctoral training in human genetics and has a master's degree in statistics. She started as faculty in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2010, pursuing research focused on understanding the genetic determinants of racial disparities and the role of gene and environment interactions in the risk for complex diseases with a specific interest in fibroproliferative disorders that include uterine fibroids and chemoids and diseases that disproportionately impact women's reproductive health. Since the start of her faculty appointment, Dr. Edwards has developed and coordinated a repository of biospecimens from participants in the rifle Mustard pregnancy cohort to be used for genetic epidemiology studies, examining reproductive health complications and risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. She has several ongoing research projects utilizing this resource, as well as large clinical databases that link clinical information to DNA. These studies focus on understanding the racial and or ethnic disparities in genetic risk for several complex diseases, including preterm birth, miscarriage, uterine fibroids, and pelvic organ prolapse. Her research is focused on understanding and identifying genetic risk factors for complex diseases with a specific focus on diseases that disproportionately impact minorities and genetic factors related to women's health and reproductive outcomes. She utilizes large clinical databases that link electronic health record information to DNA and the right from the start cohort, a community-based prospective pregnancy cohort. Current research projects include genetic studies of preterm birth, miscarriage, uterine fibroids, pelvic organ prolapse, and keloids. These, stu these studies include genome-wide association analysis next generation sequences, evaluation of biomarks, and phenol-wide association studies. I'm very happy to give the floor to Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all um, about some of the work I've been doing that integrate um, electronic health record and genomic data for studies of women's health. And feel free to interrupt me throughout um, if you have any questions or need any clarifications. But a little bit about me, and uh, I won't add too much from the, the introduction already given. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a trained human geneticist, PhD, and a master's in statistics. Um, I've had a lot of experience working with big biobanks. So I'm a PI for Vanderbilt Electronic Medical Record and Genomics Network Grant, which is a, a, a network of various biobanks throughout the US who are working together to ask questions about uh, precision medicine and uh, precision therapeutics. Um, I'm also one of the PIs for the Maternal and Pediatric Therapeutics Network, or imprint, that's focused on pharmacogenetics uh, as they pertain to pregnant populations and uh, pediatric populations. I've also worked with MVP as a co-investigator on a couple of projects, so I've worked with that system as well. Um, in addition to all the work I do in research, uh, I, I do quite a bit of work um, of my administrative and um, focused on um, training and mentoring faculty, um, as well as uh, graduate students. So I direct the Birch K-12 program, which is a K-12 program focused on sex and gender, and um, the IMSD at Vanderbilt, which is um, focused on training graduate students from underrepresented backgrounds. I've been at Vanderbilt 14 years, but as mentioned, I did my undergrad, graduate school, left for a postdoc and came back. So I, I kind of know Vanderbilt um, from many directions. I see a couple comments in chat. Okay, cool. Nothing to answer yet. Uh, if you come across a question after my talk, please feel free to email me. I'm the only Digna Velas Edwards at Vanderbilt, so I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> Um, 
so with regards to my program, I, I work in, I would say, four broad areas. So gynecologic health, which covers several topics, uh, primarily being uh, my work in uterine fibroids, maternal child health uh, on various uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes and pharmacogenetics, um, the intersection of health disparities across these conditions, because as you will see in the literature, pretty much any uh, condition that affects uh, a woman or um, uh, pregnancy um, in any way tends to suffer from significant numbers of health disparities and affect populations differently. Um, and I come from primarily the genomics perspective or the multiomics perspective, but I do also um, conduct studies um, that are primarily epidemiology. <laughs> I always like to start off these presentations by kind of explaining what I mean by women's health, because the definition can vary across the research question being asked. So broadly, it's the study, diagnosis, and treatment of conditions that impact women, but this can include both female biological sex uh, and or those who identify as women, depending on what questions you're asking. Um, types of research commonly associated include maternal child health studies, gynecologic studies, but often forgotten. This also includes studies looking at sex differences. So looking at diseases that affect both um, uh, men and women, um, but have different prevalence rates um, and that may be due to different mechanisms. And women's health is highly intersectional in that um, it is really affected by multiple potential factors. So mm -hmm. intersectionality is just a, a terminology used to describe a theoretical framework where understanding how aspects of a person's social, political identities might create advantages or disadvantages um, that are felt through people through a combination of factors. So things that affect women's health can include biology, but it also includes several external factors and several social determinants of health. And although I focus my presentation primarily on um, potential inherited factors that are driven by genetics, I, I always like to acknowledge that it isn't in a void and there's several external factors that also contribute to um, disease risk prevalences and risk that um, are fairly complex. And so ideal study designs would include all sorts of factors um, that would help you understand women's health risk. Um, so it's fairly complex to analyze women's health conditions. And uh, as uh, evident from the, the title, uh, my focus is on data science and women's health. Um, and linked here at the bottom is a review article that I wrote last year with my research team um, that kind of goes over considerations and aspects of doing research in data science for women's health. The data science in women's health is highly interdisciplinary. Um, it can include many different kinds of data um, and many different kinds of approaches. So big data, data mining, machine learning, studies that integrate electronic health record, genomic data, biological information, knowledge learned from animal studies, um, knowledge learned from epi studies, workforce knowledge. Um, all of this can go into um, conducting work that's termed data science um, as related to women's health. And this is a grown field. Um, you know, data science as a whole has been um, a field that's been growing over time. Uh, the time for growth has been a little slower for studies, specifically data science and women. Um, but we did a review of the literature for uh, that review article and pulled the papers that were focused on data science approaches for women's health or that incorporated data science to ask research questions. And uh, what you'll see here, this is the number of publications. This is 1967 to 2022. Um, and you'll see that there's been a steady increase in these types of papers over time. So it's a growing and developing field um, that has really evolved since the 2000s, which makes sense. That's when more electronic health record systems, more technology has been developed. So there's just been more data available. And a similar growth has been seen in both studies specific to electronic health records, as well as studies uh, specific to genomic data. Um, you can see here, number of published studies, um, years of time, this is from 2000 to present. Uh, on the top are electronic health record based data science studies. On the bottom are genomic based uh, data science studies. 
And you can see there's been steady growth since the 2000s with inflection points around 2010. Um, a lot of that corresponds to GWAS uh, being uh, a more established technology, more data available, uh, as well as uh, the EPIC system and different electronic health record capture systems being more integrated in clinical care. But with all that growth, um, women's health has been slower to grow relative to studies of conditions specific to males, but also studies that aren't specific to women's health conditions. Um, and a lot of the barriers have been described as related to analytic concerns for the inclusion criteria, recruitment, measurement, and analytic strategies that include women in studies. So pregnancy and exposures during childbearing years are complex. Um, the impact of hormones on exposures and outcomes um, create barriers. For example, if you're conducting a clinical trial of a medication, um, if you include women, you know, you really have to consider their menstrual cycle or different hormonal factors that can contribute to the response of the medication um, and other factors like that. And those in general are a little more challenging to capture. And historically, because of the challenge, it has become easier to exclude uh, these populations from research. And the Office of Research in Women's Health has really made it an emphasis and priority for being more intentional about including women in different kinds of studies but also for presenting um, uh, data that include um, sex stratified information. Um, there's also the complexity in study design um, by including women. There's been the perspective of women as a vulnerable population as well that has created barriers to this. Um, and as a result, most of the really well-established studies of women's health have been these very carefully collected prospective longitudinal cohorts, like the Women's Health Initiative, the Cardio Cohort, um, uh, and other population-based cohort like NHANES that have carefully uh, conducted surveys and gotten very granular information. In addition to those kinds of barriers, there's also the biases in funding. Um, you know, you see less research published a lot of times because they're funded differently. So studies evaluating funding patterns have showed that funding favors diseases that are specific to males compared to those that disproportionately impact women. Uh, so male-focused studies, historically, hopefully not moving forward, are, have been funded at twice the amount compared to diseases that are more prevalent or primarily affect women. Um, and in addition to this, it also extends to the funding to PI. So first-time women PIs who historically lead most of women's health and sex and gender research were awarded 25% less money than first time male PIs. So there's been all these barriers and that explains slow growth and everything else that you've seen with regards to development in this research area. But there is room for growth. And I think funding as you've seen in some initiatives announced by the White House and more awareness have really brought into light that more research needs to be done specific to women's health. Um, and, you know, there are opportunities to leverage all of these resources that exist um, throughout the US, not only all of those prospective well characterized and collected cohorts like uh, WHI, Cardia, uh, Black Women's Health Study, um, but also these big biobanks. Um, these are untapped resources that have quite a bit of data um, especially in the areas of um, informatics and genomics types of research that can be tapped into to ask questions about women's health. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of these resources, uh, two of them being BioView DNA Repository, which is the big biobank that we have accessible at Vanderbilt, as well as the Electronic Medical Record and Genomics Network, and kinds of research we're doing um, in data science that are more specific to precision medicine types of research. So big data work using EHR records at Vanderbilt. So at Vanderbilt, we're doing a lot of um, genomics and uh, big data types of methodology. Um, these include studies using machine learning and AI approaches to build phenotyping algorithms, identify populations um, who are at higher risk for certain diseases, um, risk prediction modeling and development of decision support tools. Um, there's been quite a bit of work at Vanderbilt where 
they've developed models that can augment, you know, or help a clinician um, treat a patient or identify a patient who's at higher risk of a future disease. And so they've been doing a lot of work building decision support tools that will just provide another level of evidence for the clinician to guide their care. Um, genomics work, so RNA-seq, uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, GWAS, incorporating a lot of that data, including proteomic data, um, to ask questions about women's health. Uh, we're involved in a lot of collaborative and network-based research studies like eMERGE that I've mentioned. Um, and since we have a biobank, a lot of the work we do is linking EHRs to different biospecimen types to ask questions. Specifically, I've been doing a lot of work linking these data to uh, collected uterus tissue and placental tissue. And so precision medicine approaches um, that integrate EHR and genomic data for women's health um, have included using the genomic data to develop risk prediction tools, integrating genetic and clinical data, um, using this information to improve understanding of health disparities contributing to risk, drug repurposing, so using um, GWAS data or just large-scale genomic data to identify new drug targets. Uh, for further study downstream through different pipelines. And just generally using all this data to understand um, complex disease traits through um, genome-wide approaches. And this isn't a field that's specific to us, and these are just approaches that, you know, we do. You know, precision medicine has been fairly successful, particularly in the areas of cancer. Um, one of the well-established decision support tools or prediction models has been the breast and ovarian analysis of disease incidence and carrier estimation algorithm, or the BODICEA, um, that is a model that incorporates the effects of polygenic risk, monogenic risk factors, as well as other health risk factors, um, where modeling has showed that increasing addition of these risk factors really significantly in, improve the prediction of um, your breast cancer risk. Um, that it really does augment having um, uh, health history or family history alone. And so the Bodicea model um, models cancer incidence explicitly as a function of genotypes for rare susceptibility variants together with a polygenic component. So it really does that, that idea that people are thinking about is like, how can we do precision medicine that incorporates your genetics with all of the other information? Um, and so I think examples like this really hold promise for other types of diseases uh, and other conditions that we might be able to, to use to ask um, more expanded research questions or to develop decision support tools. And so at VUMC, we have a lot of infrastructure set up for this kind of work in precision medicine. Uh, so, I, as I mentioned, BioView a few times, but BioView is our DNA repository at Vanderbilt. So, it's a uh, consented cohort of VUMC patients. Uh, and the way it works is you go to the clinic, you're getting routine care. Um, you're uh, approached, if you have not been approached before, uh, at the desk, and you're asked if you want to consent to be part of the BioView DNA repository. Um, and if you consent to participate in this resource, uh, then your blood sample that would otherwise be discarded after data collection or blood collection in the clinic will be banked and stored in their biobank resource. So it's otherwise discarded blood, so it's not asking for patients to come in for a separate visit to give blood for the study. It's they're going to give blood for whatever routine lab they're doing, and then they get the blood at that point. And the extracted DNA is de-identified and put in this mirror of our electronic health record called the synthetic derivative. And this de-identified mirror has been set up uh, and refined over the years um, to really be, you know, not re-identifiable from the researcher end or the patient end. Um, and so the way it works is uh, lab values, medication use, admissions information, demographics, uh, tumor registry is in there, clinical notes, ICD-9 codes, uh, CPT codes, all of this information is put through the system, identifiers are removed, like um, names of 
patients, doctors' names, social security numbers, all of that information is wiped from the record um, and dates are slightly shifted, um, but kept in relative reference to all of the other information. And it's put in this database that's available to investigators at Vanderbilt. Um, and it's an online searchable tool that we can use to check the counts of people meeting certain criteria for inclusion in a study. So if I wanted to know how many patients have diabetes, um, I can go into this database, look up the codes for diabetes and get a rough estimate on how many patients at Vanderbilt uh, have diabetes. And then I can get a subset of um, how many have uh, genetic data. Um, and so we use this resource a lot to build populations, to ask research questions, either using the genetic data or using the just their clinical health history data alone. And because of uh, that resource, uh, Vanderbilt was able to compete um, and become a member of the Electronic Clinical Records and Genomics Network. So it's been funded through three cycles. Uh, currently, they're in their third phase of funding. Uh, Vanderbilt is also the coordinating center um, for the network. But the way it works is that there's many sites across the US with these biobanks. Um, we all work together um, to ask directed research questions depending on the phase of funding. Um, but as a part of being a collaborative network, we also share algorithms, uh, do other secondary research projects together, and really have amplified using this resource to ask expanded research questions beyond the primary questions for uh, the network. And the current phase of the network, uh, which I'm a PI on uh, for this round, is specifically looking at the development of these genome-informed risk scores, which is just another terminology for prediction models um, for disease, where we're looking across several different complex diseases uh, developing polygenic risk scores and gathering monogenic risk information and integrating it with um, known clinical risk scores to see if we build a risk score, deliver it to the patient and their healthcare provider, will they do anything with it? Um, can it be used? Are there gaps in the way it's delivered? Uh, really understanding uh, the process of doing that, but also what the current state of time, what will the clinician do with it? You know, it could be they will do nothing and ignore it. It could be that the response of the clinician varies by medical center. So we're really exploring all of those aspects to understand if we ever wanted to really expand and make precision medicine available more broadly, where are gaps in improvements that we can make? And for this study, I'm leading the recruitment of our site. So it's about 10 sites. We're all targeting uh, 25,000 recruited for the study where we're enrolling them. Um, and this is kind of a schematic going over the steps that we're taking. We're enrolling the patients. We're collecting um, biological samples so to get their DNA. Um, and we're doing polygenic testing and monogenic testing. And we're getting both patient um, survey data and access to their clinical electronic health record. And we're using this information to generate a risk report um, that is then going to be returned to both the patient and their healthcare provider. And the goal is for us to then assess whether there's been any outcomes. So new behaviors, additional screening, healthcare changes, six to 12 months post, um, which, you know, we're right now really in the generation of the reports and return phases. And our goal is in the next year to really be doing analysis of the outcomes. And for this, you know, we're working with uh, a large informatics system that has been developed um, in, to a great degree between NHGRI and um, the coordinating center at Vanderbilt. That's a red cap dashboard that really speaks across the sites and gathers the data uh, and is really like a warehouse for the information to be analyzed for the study. Uh, and this includes quite a bit of family health history information gathered through a newly developed software tool uh, that was developed at Duke called Mitri that gathers uh, extensive family history information. 
and I mention all that um, and all of the resources like BioView um, that we've been using. Um, but the, you know, they sound boutique to Vanderbilt, but there's also this resource called All of Us that's available to everyone. And Josh Denny, he, he's a former PI of the, in the eMERGE network, former investigator at Vanderbilt, and was directly involved in a lot of the development of the informatics infrastructure for BioView. And he's created uh, a lot of the similar infrastructure in All of Us in that they have a similar search tool, uh, a similar informatics uh, setup for All of Us. And this resource is accessible to everyone. Uh, and it has the added benefit that it has intentional recruitment and engagement of historically underrepresented communities. So it really has a nice resource that's available um, nationwide and broadly with genomic information linked to electronic health record data uh, with a uh, fairly good representation of different um, social determinants of health and different ancestral groups. Um, and the nice part of it is that their target is trying to get to a million. Um, they've gotten through a lot of adult recruitment, I think up to 700,000, and they're working on pediatric and other populations now. Um, but that data is available to everyone. If somebody has a, you know, a different informatics tool that they want to use and ask similar research. And so I talked about eMERGE and what we've been doing, um, uh, as a whole in as far as like developmental uh, development resource research to um, build informatics pipelines for precision medicines from that and we're kind of mid phase going through um, our return of results processes, but I have used uh, a lot of these resources to target um, similar development within the area of women's health at Vanderbilt. So we've been leveraging these resources that we've built from eMERGE and elsewhere uh, to improve the phenotyping and develop some prediction and decision support tools for different conditions that affect women at Vanderbilt. Um, so we've been working with the informatics teams to define women's health conditions using the EHR, uh, to develop risk prediction tools, and to integrate clinical and genomic information for several conditions that I work with that include fibroids, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, preterm birth, PCOS, preeclampsia, and gestational diabetes. Um, and I'll note that you know these are kinds of things you do on your own. These are very interdisciplinary teams that you put together for, for this kind of data and that you need clinical expertise, informatics expertise to determine how you actually can uh, develop a decision support tool, geneticist and epidemiologist to do this kind of work. And for the next portion of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on specific research I have done in the area of uterine fibroids that's relevant to precision medicine and data science. And uh, I talk about uterine fibroids. It was my uh, first funded R01 at Vanderbilt. And I've now um, made a research program out of my work in uterine fibroids. Uh, when I came to Vanderbilt, all of my work was focused on pregnancy health. So I had done quite a bit of work on preterm birth and adverse pregnancy outcomes. And I had, um, as an early career faculty member at Vanderbilt, I got a faculty mentor who was senior. Uh, her name was Catherine Hartman. And she advised me to look at the Office of Research and Women's Health at their research priorities. And she said, I went to a meeting and there's all of this strategic focus on uh, improving the health of women with fibroids. And genetics is a big research gap. And so I took that little grain of advice um, and I looked at BioView and I saw that, oh, wow, that's very represented. There's a lot of people with DNA and genetic data in BioView. Uh, and I submitted my first R01 that was to do one of the first GWASs of uterine fibroids. Um, and since then, I've asked different research questions about uterine fibroids and health disparities um, with different populations um, and using different machine learning approaches. Um, but for those of you unfamiliar with uterine fibroids, they are the most common female pelvic tumor. Uh, they increase in prevalence from menarche to menopause, ranging from um, 20 to 77 percent across the reproductive health span of a woman. They account for 34 billion in yearly healthcare costs. This was a couple years ago. I think the the amount is closer to 38 billion today. Uh, it's also the leading cause of hysterectomy. 
uh, and it has significant um, differences across uh, racial populations. So black women are at two to three fold higher risk of having a fibroid um, than um, individuals of other racial groups. Uh, and this plot published by Donna Baird in 2003, uh, it was a prospective cohort where uh, they looked at um, pelvic imaging data and recruited a population of women between the ages of 35 and 50 and saw what the uh, incidence of fibroids was across ages. And they saw that the incidence of fibroids increases over time, similarly across groups, but that across at any time point or any age, um, black women are at higher risk of having a fibroid. Um, given you know, the, that this was a common condition uh, and uh, where it was established that it was highly heritable, um, we decided to do some large-scale genomic studies of fibroids. But the first thing we needed to do was develop a phenotyping algorithm, uh, which we developed within BioView. So um, a unique aspect of fibroids is that 51% um, of women have fibroids that are undiagnosed. So most women who have a fibroid don't know that they have a fibroid. Um, and that's because Fibroids can vary in size from tiny little pea-sized fibroids to, you know, cantaloupe-sized fibroids that are characterized by the size that would be um, if they were like a fetus, you know, the, do you have a fibroid that's, you know, a 20-week, you know, versus a, uh, you know, 30-week gestational uh, child fetus. Um, and so their sizes can vary significantly and the impact it has on symptoms also vary significantly. Because of that, um, diagnosis for controls is tricky. Um, and so with that knowledge, uh, we decided we needed to figure out how do we get an all image cohort of women with and without fibroids so we don't have all that heterogeneity and noise in our controls. Um, so that when we do ask our research questions, we have the power to, to see the signals. So we developed a cohort of uh, women with pelvic imaging uh, for both cases and controls. Uh, where fibroids, uh, either having a fibroid or not having a fibroid was confirmed. Uh, we did a manual chart review with this BioV resource because we're also able to look at individual records and do chart reviews and built an algorithm with 96% positive predictive value and 98% negative predictive value. Uh, and we also assessed uh, the utility of this algorithm across different ages to see if we had to limit to older women or if we could use uh, broader spectrums of age ranges, given that, you know, did we capture controls who would eventually get a fibroid and we didn't capture? So we did a lot of testing to, to refine this algorithm. Um, and so we developed this algorithm. Uh, we then um, collaborated and submitted a concept sheet to work within the eMERGE network to be able to uh, implement this algorithm at other sites. Uh, and we developed a cohort of nine sites with comparable phenotyping, genotype QC, in addition to BioView. Uh, and we did a, a large scale genetic analysis that also combined less refined phenotyping uh, from summary statistics from published studies and uh, also included UK Biobank FinGen in all this. And so for uh, we did a, an original GWAS analysis years ago uh, where we found some novel loci, but then currently uh, I have a graduate student who is doing an updated GWAS right now with all of our current resources, and she's compiled 74,000 cases that includes our well-refined phenotype along with the more broadly defined phenotypes uh, for fibroids, controls 465,000. And in her current GWAS scan, she's found 117 genomic loci with uh, 1,305 uh, independent significant SNPs and uh, 111 potentially uncharacterized in the literature uh, and potentially novel loci from the current cross-ancestry scheme. What we're doing with that data, uh, well, this is another slide showing from those findings, uh, we saw gene expression enrichment um, for uh, uterus tissue gene expression, cervix gene expression, uh, along with other tissues, but the top one was uterus, which was exciting for us in that the genes we're finding are highly expressed in the uterus. 
but the the key use of that data for the purpose of kind of the precision medicine questions we wanted to ask were for developing a polygenic risk score. So um, I think many of you might be familiar with polygenic risk is, but it's um, without going into the math, you get your uh, your genomic scan and you look at the summation of an individual's total genomic risk for a disease and you optimize a score that has the most differences between cases and controls and use that to develop a, a polygenic risk score. And why do people use polygenic risk scores today? Um, you know, in the past, you used to look at, you know, individual effects of genes or a, a genomic risk score, which is where you, you know, threshold your p-values in different ways just based on statistical significance. But uh, polygenic risk scores uses the entire genomic data to build an optimized score. Uh, it's utilized for risk prediction. Um, to identify and diagnose cases, inform clinical decision making. So you can use this for figuring out how people respond to diseases, risk for disease recurrence. Use this for to inform life planning. If you knew you're at higher risk for a, a genetic disease, could you use this to you know modify different aspects that are within your control since genetics is less in your control? Um, but that's how polygenic risk scores are are being imagined to be used. And with regards to fibroids on how, you know, having a risk score could be used, um, you know, if an individual is at high risk of having a fibroid and they they don't have one yet or they're not diagnosed, um, it could be used uh, to get earlier ultrasounds to actually get diagnosed um, for undiagnosed individuals. Uh, it could be used to prevent progression of fibroids to more larger sizes. Um, or other things like that. Do I see a question in chat? Um, yes. Uh, it, was a, it was just a comment that it's not yeah. the total uh, genomic risk, it's just the additive component. Yeah. Correct. It's the additive component, uh, additive of genomic risk. It's not the total. Yes, it's not added, but uh, it's added. Correct. Thank you. Um, so, with regards to fibroids, uh, one potential utility of early detection um, with a uh, polygenic risk score, but also with a clinical risk score that incorporates age and other factors is that you can use a clinical risk score uh, to prevent progression of fibroids to extremely large sizes. So uh, fibroids are usually removed if they're very symptomatic or become very large, um, either through myomectomies or, or total hysterectomies. But if you were able to find fibroids before they progress, you can treat with other non-invasive treatments like um, uh, medications, birth control is often used, progesterone is often used. Um, and it could also be used to preserve fertility uh, for childbearing when desired as well. And so uh, we did several polygenic risk scores. So we have developed a, a European ancestry specific one a, um, a polygenic risk score for our African ancestry subset, but we also did a cross ancestry one. Um, and so I'm showing you the results of one of the ones we built, which was for our cross ancestry one, um, where we, uh, you know, had our base and testing cohorts. But for this, we leveraged uh, non overlapping data across our analyses. We used FinGen, Biobank Japan. And we did cross validation within eMERGE and BioView. And um, for our cross validation within eMERGE and BioView, we had AUCs ranging between um, uh, 0.67 and 0.68% in eMERGE and 0.74 and 0.73 in BioView. Uh, these are just AUC curves stratified by. The cross ancestry, the MetaPRS, the European, and uh, the East Asian for the Biobank Japan. Uh, and what we saw was not atypical. So the first number you see is the AUC for the model with age, BMI, and a couple covariates, uh, which was slightly larger than the PRS alone. So the PRS by itself does not fully predict risk for disease, but when in combination with other factors, it has an aggregated amount of uh, prediction that's better than uh, without the PRS. 
which is not atypical for polygenic risks. Um, the idea is that it's used as a factor in a model, but not as a sole predictor alone. Uh, and what we're doing as our next steps is we had a simple model with age, BMI, and one other uh, uh, risk factor in the model. We're um, doing expanded models with both known risk clinical risk factors, and then we're adding novel risk factors we find from genome-wide scans that we're doing. And so I mentioned phenome-wide scan is that, that that's an approach that Vanderbilt has developed and does quite a bit. Um, it's mostly like a, an exploratory tool that you can use to um, help see if you see patterns within uh, a patient's health history data. But you evaluate the association. Uh, what we did is we evaluated the association between our uterine fibroid polygenic risk score across diagnostic codes. So we saw if this polygenic risk score associates with other diseases, um, or if it has any patterns of types of diseases that associate uh, across individuals. Um, and so we wanted to see, are there patterns observable for types of diseases associated with heritable risk of fibroids? And so what you see here is kind of a typical Manhattan plot, but each dot represents the association with our polygenic risk score and an ICD-9 diagnosis, or E code is what we call them because they're kind of constructed ICD-9 codes with drop downs removed. And we ran our polygenic risk score within our eMERGE European ancestry subset here. And we saw that our polygenic risk score uh, was well able to identify individuals with uterine fibroids. So our, our strongest association with a diagnosis for our PRS was with fibroids, which was great. And our second strongest peak it was here. Uh, so our uh, polygenic risk score also identified symptoms of having a fibroid. Uh, so this could be a combination of people who have both the diagnosis and the symptoms or people who have the symptoms and are undiagnosed. But we found that to be strong results for this polygenic risk score being able to identify um, our um, phenotype um, in a population. And so other questions we wanted to ask were, can we learn about the relationship between fibroids and other conditions using the EHR? So we saw that there was, um, you know, our PRS primarily associated with fibroids and um, it, conditions related to fibroids or fibroid symptoms. But independent of genetics, we wanted to see if we can scan across the EHR and see if fibroids uh, had any other comorbidities that weren't characterized or are associated with other diseases that haven't been fully characterized in the literature, uh, independent of genetics. So using that SD database independent of um, the GWAS or other genetic data. So we did a fibroid scan where it's the fibroid is the outcome and having a fibroid is the outcome and we scanned across all of the codes. So this is about 8,000 fibroid cases that we had in our subset of the SD that we were evaluating. And this was about 50,000 uh, uh, females without fibroids that we uh, ran association analyses across these phenotyping codes. And what we saw was we had a lot of neoplasms and a lot of genitourinary conditions that popped up. Uh, these included several cancers, uh, several benign types of neoplasms, as well as several other gynecologic conditions like endometriosis that popped up. And I know that's a lot of data on the screen, but what we're doing in our next analyses I present will be uh, condensing those to some targeted analysis. So we saw that there was several um, associations that we hadn't observed before that um, our relationship between fibroids and other conditions. And so what we did as a next step is we took those conditions uh, that we observed with neoplasms and genitourinary conditions. And this was work done by um, my graduate student who re recently graduated and is at NHGRI right now as part of her dissertation. Um, but she wanted to see if we did a, a, like a large-scale genomic scan of fibroids and other diseases 
uh, can we then do uh, secondary analyses to determine the causal relationship between fibroids and those diseases? So that is, does fibroids cause, let's say, endometriosis, or does endometriosis cause fibroids? Um, and to do that, she did two sample bidirectional Mendelian randomization. Um, she narrowed down this list of diseases to a smaller subset that were available within the UK Biobank and FinGen to have an independent population to do this analysis in. Uh, so she evaluated 25 genital urinary conditions and 26 neoplasms and tested whether those conditions were uh, causes or consequences of having fibroids. And uh, to do the causal relationship tests in both directions, since it's uh, bidirectional, we did an inverse variance, inverse inverse weighted variance test, or IVW. Uh, we also tested for horizontal pleiotropy. That is, um, does our genetic instrument um, uh, influence our outcome independent of exposure? And to walk you through this a little bit, you know, our genetic instrument here is a polygenic risk score. That we developed for fibroids. Um, and we won, which is used as our instrumental variable for fibroids. And our horizontal pleiotropy test uh, tests whether that, uh, that genetic instrument um, influences the, the outcome independent of, let's say, having a fibroid. Uh, and that was tested through MR Ecker. And for our analyses looking at does fibroid cause these various genital urinary conditions, uh, this is the list of results that were statistically significant. We saw very strong effects for endometriosis, which I like to highlight here because that's an established uh, relationship that's been seen in the literature and this direction of effect was consistent where fibroids seem to be causing endometriosis, uh, at least in uh, two recently published studies we've seen. Uh, but we also saw several other relationships, such as fibroids seeming to cause ovarian cysts and some relationships with some um, other female pelvic conditions, um, as well as benign mammary dysplasia. And when we tested for horizontal pleiotropy with MR Egger, we saw that breast conditions, um, congenital or hormone related, uh, the code for that also was statistically significant, which means that our genetic instrument um, seems to um, influence this outcome uh, through some mechanism that's not through fibroids. So the genetic instrument through fibroids seems to influence this code independent of uh, the individual having a fibroid. When we looked in the inverse direction, so genital urinary conditions causing fibroids, we only saw two significant associations. The strongest was for hematorrhea, uh, which is bleeding in the pelvis, um, which has been associated with having a fibroid, but how mechanistically that would work, we don't know, but that was the strongest association we took um, as far as significance. Uh, odds ratio, it was uh, 1.34 polyps of female genital organs. And when we looked at the neoplasm categories, fibroids causing neoplasms, we saw several associations at several cancers, uh, particularly uh, of note, uh, we had skin cancer like coma, cervical cancer, um, but we also saw association and breast cancer, which has been observed before, um, particularly benign tumors of the breast have associated quite a bit in the literature with fibroids, um, but we also saw benign um, benign uh, neoplasms of the skin um, and the ovary, among others. And we saw evidence of horizontal pleiotropy for uh, breast cancer, um, acquired absence of breast, and colorectal cancer for the direction of neoplasm causing effect. But our overall conclusions uh, on these analyses were that we constructed and validated uh, PRS for fibroids. We constructed RPS using uh, our data and publicly available data. Uh, not shown here, we validated the, our data for the PRS in a third population, all of us. Uh, and we're currently working on building a more robust clinical model that will include the PRS using FIWAS and machine learning. And we also saw that fibroids 
are causal towards several gynecologic conditions and other neoplasms from our um, Mendelian randomization analysis. And we also saw causic genetic variants for breast cancer, increased risk for fibroids through horizontal pride in cardiolysis. And um, as we kind of close up on the presentation, that was a summary of how I implemented some of these precision medicine approaches to some of my research, but I wanted to close on, you know, really on the future of precision medicine in women's health. Um, there's been a lot of visions on how precision medicine would work and be implemented. Um, but, you know, the idea has been that genomics will eventually be routine and microbiome measures routinely collected, which seems kind of ambitious. Um, you know, we really want to see genome aware electronic health records that make pharmacogenetic testing easy and automated. Uh, we want to see data easily moved between EHRs and participant apps for those who have things like Fitbits uh, and cell phone data. Um, geocoding of exposures and linkages of real-time monitoring of multiple exposures uh, and integrating wearable technology. This is kind of Josh Denny and Francis Collins' vision of where precision medicine could be one day, let's say down the road in 2030. Uh, I really think that'll be a bit of a challenge because not everyone has access to you know, large uh, clinical healthcare centers that have accessibility to um, you know, even a uh, app available electronic health record. Um, but, you know, ambitiously, this would be amazing if we can get there. Um, you know, I, there's a note on AI in healthcare. I think that's been a, a hot topic at Vanderbilt because we're a big informatics group. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, could this be used? Are there challenges with using AI? Um, but the idea has been that, you know, maybe AI could be used in precision dis, uh, medicine to to help build models like this, or you know, help build phenotyping algorithms. Uh, you know, learning from data, but also learning from external data resources, drug discovery, medical diagnostics, and robotics using AI. But you know, to get to that vision of you know precision medicine for you know 2030, you know, we need to do a lot of development. You know, so we need more diverse populations represented in research. I think only. Uh, 20 percent of current genetic studies are, are non-European ancestry, so 80 percent are European ancestry. So we really can't make assertions of genetics with data learned from primarily one ancestral group. Um, we need more routinely available data. So genomic data, lab assays, and environmental data aren't available on every patient we have. Um, uh, systems have been developed to try to, like Epic is a very good resource for um, clinical care, and it has a lot of ability to gather um, other kinds of data, but we still need ways to get environmental data in patients' records and nutritional information, which I think we're a few steps away from. Uh, more affordable assays and computational resources. Um, whole genome costs um, you know, are about $500 a sample, um, but that's a big jump from when I was a graduate student. I think it was like when I first, not as a graduate student, when I first started as faculty, it was about $2,000 for a whole genome. Um, and, um, you know, the price is slowly becoming more available, but also the analysis of that data, it comes at a cost and requires a lot of access to resources like cloud computing. Um, and, you know, we also need to have a better understanding of ethical implications of tools like AI, you know, using chat GPT in research and in healthcare, how ethical is that to access information from patients to learn from? Um, so I think there's a lot of ethical concerns of um, using patient data to learn from. And I think, you know, we're steps away from um, being able to use AI fully in healthcare. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge my lab um, and my research team and various grant fundings of mine. These are various pictures of my lab over time um, during different events, including this was at our um, eclipse, not the most recent eclipse, but the eclipse that happened a few years ago um, in my lab. But with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Um, 
it looks like it looks like there are some questions in the chat. Maybe we can start there and then if people want to just unmute. I see one. Um, I, I see a couple. Do sex hormone levels act as mediators? That's completely possible. Um, and, and if you do a FIWAS with nuclear receptor hormones, do you get hits for fibroids, et cetera? You know, those are things that haven't been done. So um, I wonder, you know, you know, we, we used a um, polygenic risk score. So it's a kind of aggregate risk score across many different genes um, to do our FIWAS scan. Um, so we didn't target a specific gene, but it's really interesting um, question. Like if we targeted looking at specific hormone receptor genes, what effects would we see in our football skins? Um, I think that's a good question to ask, but we haven't done that yet. Um, um, what, what is the earliest age at which females have fibroids? Do they get them pre-menarche ever? Uh, I don't think they get a pre-menarche. Uh, the all of the uh, the literature says it happens after uh, first menarche, um, and there's been associations with age at menarche and having um, both worse fibroids and more symptomatic fibroids. So the longer you have to to have a menarche, so if you have a you had an early menarche that started at eight, you tend to have uh, a higher and more severe uh, fibroid. Uh, is what at least we've seen from the epi literature. Um, from the prospective cohorts. I don't know if if Nashville is like uh, Memphis, but if you do, if you drive around the 240 loop of Memphis, you will encounter at least three big billboards that advertise for fibroid diagnosis and surgery. Must be a huge money maker. Oh, as far as like uh, the expense, and I mean, I think it's a uh, you know money maker. Yeah, but I mean, I think. <laughs> Uh, a lot of women that way, but it, so it seems like they're targeting a specific but... audience to 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 uh, you know generate income, which is not that unusual among physicians. God forbid. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think what happens is you know some populations get hysterectomies at higher rates, um, and it's all really been observed to be dependent on your desire to preserve your fertility, because the only one true cure for fibroids is to remove your uterus because so many people get treated with, with these surgical procedures that don't fully remove the fibroid, like um, um, myomect uh, I, myomectomy will remove it um, and uh, hysterectomy re will remove it, but there's other procedures that will uh, burn off a fibroid, but then fibroids might pop up somewhere else. And so what happens is if you repeatedly get fibroid for so long, uh, and it's still causing the severe symptoms. I think at some point, if you don't want to preserve your fertility, they'll say, well, let's do one of the more invasive procedures and just solve it now. Um, and, you know, remove your uterus or, you know, do a, a more surgical based procedure. And I think that is really the determination of when they want to go to the surgical route, because otherwise they'll try to treat it as long as you want to have a child. Um, and you know, risk the recurrence. Um, but I haven't seen billboards over here. We don't have a lot of billboards on fibroids. So you guys must have even more fibroids in Memphis than we have in Nashville. A couple more questions. Uh, what are, are the privacy implications uh, of all this data collections? Do we have adequate protection from malicious actors? Uh, that is a really great question. So we have a big ethical group at Vanderbilt that's focused exclusively on uh, ethics and uh, figuring out like, is this resource hackable? Um, Brad Malin and Ellen Clayton at Vanderbilt um, are really engaged in these privacy aspects of having these databases and the barriers that they have to have in place to protect the data. Um, and I think at least what we have on our end, it feels pretty safe with all of the barriers that have been placed for data protection and privacy of the data. Um, uh, but other resources, I mean, you've seen 23andMe was hacked and some of these other major um, national databases have been hacked. So, um, you know, there, you have genomic data like that. It is potentially vulnerable 
um, if you don't have really strict access and protections in place. Vanderbilt hasn't had a hack um, like that. Um, and you know, from my understanding, they they frequently try to see if with the protections that they have, they can hack it. And so far it's been pretty safe. And, and I agree, the omic data is particularly vulnerable because you can really identify patients um, with that information. I fully agree. Do you Im do a full impute to 10 million common variants? Oh, for the uh, for the genomic data we have, yeah, we do top med imputation um, with uh, the top med imputation panel. Um, so yeah, so we, we do full imputation for using it. Right now, we're going through, uh, well, we have a couple of resources. So right now, we have a partnership with Illumina that is going to allow us to do whole genome sequencing on 250,000 of our patients uh, with genomic data in BioView. So we'll have whole genome level data fairly soon in the next two years, I believe. Right now we have about 35,000 of those done. But in the past, in the data you saw, those were mega array data that were um, you know, imputed with PopMed. I'm gonna ask a question for Enza, unless she wants to ask it herself. I don't know if it's the same. You go ahead first. <laughs> how about how about long read sequence? <laughs> Did oh, I ask you a question, Enza? <laughs> No, it was another one. So, but that's also interesting. How about long read sequencing? And then I have another one for later. Uh, I, I, I don't know that we've done long read sequencing with the specific platform that they're using. Um, but I know that there are several subsets of the BioView data that are being redeposited that have used the um, the long read system uh, for for generating the sequencing data. Yeah, I would be surprised that you would have done in a, like a, for the whole biorepository. You know, so I, there's, there's it's still there. compatible with a subset. That, no, but I have another question. Actually, I have two. Sure. I'll start with the first, like in choice in, in the choice of cases, mm -hmm. um, uh, how, I mean, you show a practical example for one phenotype, but did you ever manage to, um, automate this like a case choices for several phenotypes um because i um you know there's a whole set maybe sylvia is the most expert in that but there's a whole set of like um things to take into account and comorbidities and so forth and this is really difficult uh to uh in our short experience to do in a, a automated way like you know so so in other words, like when you choose cases, uh, you always have to refine manually uh, the case selection. I wonder if you have um, an automated recipe for that. Yeah, so once we build, because uh, we're allowed to use NLP also. So like we have, uh, we, we do code-based phenotyping uh, and different investigators do. The, uh, there's a whole group who does machine learning completely and they, they refine their, mm -hmm. their text. The phenotyping I have done has been code base with NLP, so using um, keywords from records and, you know, instances. Um, but every time we built them, because we built it, we built some for PCOS, endometriosis, uh, preterm birth, we used a more machine learning approach because it was part of a, a project of a student um, doing that work. Um, each of those uh, development involves a chart review component to validate it. And then once we've developed it and it's been uh, refined and we feel confident with like our keyword inclusions, exclusion, and the NLP pieces, then we automate it and make it an automated piece. But we always do the refining steps in several iterations until um, we feel confident that it's, it's fairly valid and it has good mm -hmm. um, um, positive, negative predictive value in all the, the metrics. And the other curiosity is that I might might have missed something, but like so, the when you uh when you do fibros uh, uh with like uh, uh markers implicated in defining the polygenic risk score, did you have a happen to show that uh you know some of the disease are um captured uh in like European but not in uh, other um uh, you know other populations. Uh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. We definitely see different performance depending on um, right. the the risk score, like cross ancestry and, and European ancestry. You know, usually 
most things perform better on European ancestry substance. Right. Uh, uh, and that is, you know, combination of, you know, power to really get a really good score in our um, non-European ancestry subsets, but also, um, you know, the imputation and all the other aspects. Mm, yeah, all the things count. Yeah, our, our, exactly. Yeah, so it's all, so it's like a, uh, then that goes to the issue of we need more data, uh, not just data engagement of other populations and research on all the levels from workforce to, you know, um, right. participants um, to be able to, to really get good diverse data that is, you know, managed equitably and um, accessible. What, what is the eMERGE proportion of um, African or African-American ancestry? Is it up to 20%? That is the target for the current phase. So right now we're still finishing off recruitment, which all obviously poses challenges depending on which site you're recruiting from, uh, since it has sites from across the US and some have better relationships and opportunities to uh, recruit more underserved or underrepresented populations. But the target, I think, is 20%. Um, in, in the past, it hasn't always been that high, I believe. Um, but um, I think the kind of the strategic representation of eMERGE captures a pretty good amount of diversity on, on where these sites are located. I just, I mean, just, just to showcase here, sorry, I can't refrain to do that. So it, we have a, a, a database here uh, that contains about uh, thirty percent of uh, um, I mean it's uh, fourteen thousand electronic records and sixteen thousand um, um, sample by specimen of which like thirteen thousand have been sequenced, and the proportion of like uh, non-European is fifty percent like you know and, and this proportion being yeah being like twenty percent mm -hmm. Africans in and the rest admix it. And, and we do infer the ancestry from the genetic markers. Uh, sure. So it's not self-reported, although they correlate a lot. So, you know, sure. just, I'm sorry, just to show, just to show half this very important resource we have. So maybe we can talk, or we can take this offline. Yeah. I think what sites to do is recruit in communities that are more yeah. diverse and have relationships and, you know, ability to, to really, get good, uh, you know, diversity in the recruitment. Um, and, you know, I, th I think they have, you know, our partners in UAB are pretty good and in New York. Um, but as a whole, we need more, more geographic diversity uh, to be able to, to recruit. Yeah, the, the cool thing, Digna, is that um, the cohort that Enza just mentioned is almost all pediatric. We're expanding it across the state and the intent is to have 100,000 uh, Tennesseans in the big program. It's modeled after BioView. So as soon as BioView fired up, we were already doing a, a small version of, of uh, a BioView and we opened it up and, and worked with our pediatric hospital. So it was modeled after BioView and CHOP at that point. And it's finally real because Regeneron stepped into the breach and said, yep, we'll genotype and do exome sequencing for 100K of your subjects. And we hope that 50% of them will be um, African ancestry. Wow, because we have such pitiful representation of pediatric populations in, in any major study, like across the board. You know, CHOP is part of eMERGE, so they, they provide, you know, great data, but there's few CHOPs around. Um, who have resources like that. So that sounds like an amazing resource to, to ask a lot of genetic questions. What is the name of the cohort again? And so you want to yeah, unmute? It, it, yeah, yeah, it is, it's called um, uh, BIG, which stands for Biorepository for Integrative Genomics. And it's part of a larger consortium, which is the CIG, uh, which acronym stands for Rob Helton as the common anyway uh can can't remember the CIG but it's I mean I, I can email you details um offline cool and, and if anybody has any 
questions or, you know, I'm happy to connect anyone to anyone or if there's opportunities to collaborate, uh, anyone interested in pediatric or maternal populations, please feel free to reach out, especially we're all in Tennessee. So that makes collaborating yeah, easy. easier. Yeah. We, we actually used BioView with Josh uh, in 2015 to do a FIWAS of mouse and human. Uh, because we have a very good EHR for mouse, believe it or not, for a large family. And that it worked tremendously well. And I'd love to revisit that if everybody has band, if anybody at, at in Vanderbilt has any extra bandwidth, which I kind of doubt, because working with Josh, it was like, oh my God. <laughs> and you're probably Josh. just as bad, Digna. <laughs> Intense. Uh, that's why he's the CEO of all of us now. He's taken the intensity of enough a notch um but you know reach out i mean i i'm happy to if, if i can't do it i'm happy to connect you with somebody who can i think we've we figured out a lot of ways to really do fewas efficiently um with the tools we have um and so i fully think that's possible that that's a uh... That sounds good. I like the uh, the idea that people can uh, collaborate based on this meeting. Um, I just had a, um, I was interested in, I'm not up to date on the biology of fibroids, but is it possible to, um, like, are there like subcategories of severity? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, is this a possible route or avenue is maybe figuring out if there's genetic variation that might sort of be predictive of more severe outcomes? Yeah, so uh, fibroids have uh, subtypes uh, that are characterized by um, the location of the fibroid in the uterus that often are correlated with if they're more symptomatic. So some are embedded in the muscle, some are superficially like on the inner lining, and some are kind of crossing both uh, fields. And uh, those are typically characterized during the ultrasound. So that's at least a, a, an aspect of the data that's easily captured and, and be able to pull. We've done um, some work on that, but most of the work we've done has been on the size of the fibroid and number of the fibroids, because often that correlates also with uh, pregnancy complications and um, um, some of the bleeding aspects um, is the size, but that's inconsistently captured. So we've tried to build phenotyping algorithms to pull out like largest dimension of the, the growth and other aspects like that. Um, from the imaging data that is reported. All right, that's great. Sounds like there's a lot of there's a lot more data to be analyzed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I honestly think that's the the next phase of really understanding fibroids is really going into the subphenotypes and the severity from the the size of the tumors and the the location in the uterus. Yeah. 